morning, everyone. Uh, I'm John Turner. I'm the president of IAMAS, and it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Ed Hawkins from the University of Reading in the UK, where he's a professor of climate science in the Department of Meteorology, and he's also a principal research scientist at the UK National Centre for Atmospheric Research. Ed has very broad interests uh, in climate, from extreme meteorological events and Arctic sea ice, which you've heard a little about, to decadal variability and prediction of climate, along with quantifying uncertainty in the predictions. He's also a lead author for the upcoming IPCC sixth assessment report. Uh, he has a very strong presence online, he's very well known, where he's the editor of the Climate Lab Book, and he's uh, also known for his innovative graphics depicting climate variability and change. So other interests he has include history of climate science and data rescue, and it's the latter that he's going to discuss in detail today, which is on improving atmospheric reconstructions for historical extreme events by rescuing lost weather observations. Ed. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, so it's a delight to be here um, uh, talking about extreme weather events and, and how we might learn more about them uh, from the past. Um, so there's a, it's been a big team effort, this, but none of my co-authors are more important than the 4,000 volunteers that have contributed to this work, and we'll hear more about them uh, in a moment. Um, but I'd like to start um, uh, with a sort of visualisation. Uh, this is our local temperature record to where we are at the moment in Quebec. These are the annual temperatures from the 1870s up to today, um, uh, essentially just shown as coloured stripes. Um, so we are just seeing the long-term warming trend uh, in temperatures in this region with lots of an interannual and decadal variability superimposed. Now this isn't the way we normally look at this type of data. We would normally have a time series and, and, and analyse it, but this way has proved rather popular for communicating to a much broader audiences. Um, and so uh, over the last few weeks we, we've uh, launched a website, showyourstripes.info, uh, where you can download these graphics for any country around the world. Uh, and so far, we've had over a million downloads of these graphics. They've been very, very popular and been used in all kinds of different situations to start the conversations, to talk about the narrative that we've heard a lot about already, to start conversations about climate change. It's a simple visualisation, as you can imagine, uh, and all it does is start those important conversations we need to have about the implications of our warming world. But what we may also forget is that originally these observations that produce our annual temperature record for Quebec and every other country were originally written on paper. They were written down by the observer, uh, calculated into monthly averages or annual averages, uh, and someone has gone back and transcribed those observations to turn them into digital data that we can analyse uh, and use. Um, and the reason that we were doing this, doing the rescue of this data from the past, was essentially to answer the policy relevant question that we were set as a community, is our climate changing uh, and is it our fault? You know, that's been the question guiding a lot of climate science for over the last several decades um, and we've answered those questions in the affirmative, of course. Um, so now we, we have very different questions perhaps that we're starting to think about more and more um, uh, as we look ahead to the future. Policymakers are now coming to ask questions such as what's gonna happen to our weather? What are the implications of our warming world for our weather patterns and how we experience the weather from day to day? Um, and this is a very, very different problem. It's a much harder problem. And so we have you know, lots of examples from um, uh, extreme weather events. So this is going to be a very UK, European focused talk, but the principle is very, very general, um, thinking about extreme weather wherever you may live. So um, this is a, one example in the UK, a very famous windstorm from the 1980s. Um, knocked down lots of trees, um, caused a great deal of damage um, across the country. And, um, you know, policymakers come and ask us, you know, are these types of events going to become more frequent or less frequent in the future? It's very important for the insurance industry, for, for policymaking about um, planning uh, to deal with these types of extreme weather event. Um, and that's a much harder question about whether these storms have become more or less frequent. Um, and another example might be flooding as well. We, we saw extreme flooding in the UK uh, in January 2014. Um, you know, thousands of homes flooded. Um, and again, policymakers come to, come to the community and say, you know, what's going to happen to these extreme flooding events? Are they going to become more frequent? Um, are they going to become more intense? You know, is this the worst that could happen? Uh, and the answer is probably not. 
um, because you know we understand there's lots of variability in our weather, but it's also very important to look back uh, in time as well. These events are relatively rare, and so if we want to understand um, and answer questions about their frequency and their intensity, we need to find as many examples as we can in the historical record and learn as much about them if we're to inform these important uh, questions about how the risk of this type of event is changing now uh, and as we look forward to the future. So again, focusing in the UK, um, we've, we've seen lots of flooding before. Um, this is one example uh, from June 1903. Um, uh, and so these are actually postcards that were uh, created at the time. Uh, so someone took a photograph, printed a set of postcards, and you could send them to your friends um, in other parts of the country to tell them what had been going on in your life. Um, this, is the sort of, this is how Instagram used to be um, back in 1903. Um, and, and these were only created for very extreme sort of situations, and so we, you know, we have confidence that this was a very unusual uh, event for a postcard to be created. Um, we also have another example. This is a, another postcard from October 1903. Uh, another, another town uh, with a flood. Again, these postcards were sent all over the country. Um, this isn't very quantitative, but it is quite qualitative information that this was an extreme weather event. Um, and actually, our observations of rainfall, direct observations, suggest actually that some of this flooding was much larger than we saw in 2014 in the UK. More rain fell um, in, in 1903 than it, it did in the event that I showed earlier. So this is an important event we might want to think about trying to understand more if we're to inform those questions about you know, how high do we need to build our flood defences uh, in future to, to stop homes being flooded. Also in 1903, it's a very interesting year <laughs> in the UK for extreme weather, um, we had a very, very uh, intense storm uh, hit the UK. Um, we saw that the great storm of 1987, photographed just now. Um, again, another postcard from February 1903, uh, this time in Dublin in Ireland where 3,000 trees were ripped up in a single park uh, overnight um, uh, in February 1903. And you can see all these people looking rather confused about why all these trees had blown over. Um, but th so this storm was a very intense storm. We have another postcard uh, here from uh, northern England in a town called Morecambe, where the pier was blown down um, during this same storm in February 1903. So very obviously a very, very intense gale. Uh, we'd like to know more about it. Um, to, to understand the risk of these types of events causing damage. Insurance companies, for example, would like to know about the risk of these types of events. So what do we know about this event, you know, all that, all that time ago? So they were taking observations at this time, uh, obviously, and this is um, the synoptic chart draw, hand-drawn by the Met Office in the UK um, uh, using data collected on 8 a.m. on the 27th of February 1903 as this storm crossed the country. You can see this low pressure center uh, over Scotland, um, isobars packed closely together over Ireland and northern England, um, obviously very intense winds causing all the, all the damage that we saw in the photographs. Um, the storm central pressure, about 956 millibars, this was a, you know, a very intense storm. This is you know, one snapshot and one hand-drawn uh, picture um, uh, at the time, and the observations that the Met Office used to create this were essentially sent by telegraph cable from the, the observing stations around the country, uh, telegraphed to London, so they were able to, to, tra to draw this map every single morning, uh, and th these maps were published every day. So the question is, what's happened to the data, and you know, what can we say about this storm using our modern technology? And so our modern technology is what we would call a reanalysis. So we will go back and essentially do a weather forecast for 1903 using the data that we have available for that storm. So we're only going to, so in these construction of these reanalyses, we only take the pressure observations that were measured uh, at that time uh, and use those pressure observations with a modern numerical weather forecasting model to create a, what we think the atmosphere was doing at that time, every hour if we want to. So we can re reconstruct the, the atmospheric circulation every hour uh, back in 1903. Um, and this is the, the map from the, the latest version of what we call the 20th century reanalysis for the time that we have this synoptic chart from the Met Office. And there's a lot of sim similarities. We can see that see the storm center over Scotland, um, but what you do notice is that the isobars are not packed so quite so closely together in the simulation. The central pressure is, is nowhere near 
uh, as low. It's about 10 millibars too shallow, uh, which means the wind, the simulated winds in this reanalysis are nowhere near strong enough to cause the damage we know happened. So what's going on? Why can we not reconstruct this storm with our modern technology and modern supercomputers now, as well as the Met Office could draw it by hand um, in 1903? And the reason is we don't have the observations. So here's a map of the observations in our pressure database for that morning of the storm, February the 27th, 1903. The yellow dots are all of the observations we have available. There is not a single observation over England or Wales, and that's true for about 40 years um, uh, from the 1880s to the 1920s. And for, for the country that pioneered weather forecasting, this is rather embarrassing. Um, you know, even the observation from the Met Office itself in London is not available digitally for us to use to reconstruct these past storms. You can see country boundaries on this map. Certain countries have made great efforts to rescue the past observations to use to be able to reconstruct past weather. But nations like the UK, France, Spain, um, the observations are, are far more sparse, large blank areas, which means we cannot, re re we cannot be so confident about reconstructing the weather uh, over these large regions as much as we would like. We can't simulate these extreme weather events that we'd like to know more about. So the question is, where are the observations? The Met Office had them in 1903 to be able to draw their weather chart. So where are they? So we're, we're going to go on a bit of a quest um, a search for, to try and locate these lost observations. Now, they're not lost in you know, a permanent sense. You know, they are stuck in various archives um, around the country and around the world. So you know, observations are missing everywhere around the world. There are enormous archives of missing observations which we could all rescue uh, and learn more about the, the, the weather events. So we're going to start our quest for these observations um, in a rather un unusual location. Ben Nevis Mountain, which is the highest point of the United Kingdom. It's the coldest, wettest, cloudiest place in the country, um, 1,345 metres above sea level. Now, this may be an, you know, a, a surprising place for us to start uh, this discussion about where there might be observations um, until you realise that in 1903 and for 20 years prior, three rather intrepid, slightly crazy meteorologists had lived at the summit for 20 years from 1883 to 1904. And this is a picture of their hut uh, that they lived in. Uh, they lived there all year round in winter and summer uh, in the coldest, wettest place in, in the country. You can see this, the, the rhyming, uh, the ice uh, glued to, the, to their hut, um, which they lived in. Um, and these are the three meteorologists who were there at this time, uh, Rankin, Omond, and Mossman. So they lived there all year round. They're essentially cut off and isolated during the winter months. You couldn't get to the observatory. Um, supplies were brought up during the summertime by pony. Um, but they're essentially cut off for six months every year um, in the winter time. Um, to, 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 to survive by themselves. And the reason, the only reason they were there was to take weather observations. There, there, was, there had been a funding, a crowdfunding uh, effort to try and create an observatory as high as we could in the United Kingdom to take observations as high up in the atmosphere as we could. They wanted to understand how the atmosphere changed with height. And so they, they had to go to the highest place, um, no matter what the, that meant for the people living there. And so they took hourly weather observations every single hour of every single day and every single night uh, for 20 years um, during this period. There was also a, um, a companion observatory at sea level in the town of Fort William, just five kilometres away. Um, so they had direct comparable measurements for sea level and the highest point in the country uh, to be able to compare and contrast the observations and understand how the atmosphere changed with height. <coughs> And so while their contemporaries were off exploring the Arctic or the Antarctic, uh, I, I like to think of these three meteorologists as exploring the atmosphere. They were you know, living in pretty um, rough conditions uh, for very long periods of time just to take these weather observations. And this is the only format we have the observations currently. 2,000 pages printed, published, um, and now scanned. <coughs> so this is one page um, from the observatory logbooks. Um, this is the temperature in January 1898. Every hour we have the dry bulb, the wet bulb temperature, um, so we can measure the humidity uh, for every single hour of every single day in that particular month. There's about one and a half million hourly observations of temperature, pressure, wind and rainfall. 
um, from these two observatories. Um, so the question is, how do, we, how do we recover these observations from these printed pages into something more useful? We tried automatic optical character recognition. It's very hard to get that software, that type of technique to work on tabulated numerical data like this printed um, uh, all that time ago. So I asked a PhD student, <laughs> would you like to type in one and a half million uh, observations? Um, uh, you can imagine their answer. Um, definitely not. Um, so how are we going to do this? How are we going to recover these uh, observations uh, taken all that time ago? So um, the answer was to turn to volunteers. Um, but first of all, here is the, uh, another page from, the, from, from those logbooks. This is the pressure observations taken by the barometer um, in February 1903. Uh, and here is the observation of that storm, uh, the great storm passing near Ben Nevis. This is the lowest pressure observation at 5 a.m. Uh, on that morning. So it, this includes measurements of that storm, which we could use to reconstruct the, the passage of, of that extreme storm uh, hour by hour uh, across Scotland. So how are we going to do this? How are we going to um, recover and digitise all of these lost observations? So we turn to volunteers. So we set up a website, weatherrescue.org, <coughs> which uses a, a, a web platform called the Zooniverse, which some of you may have come across. Um, and we essentially recruited thousands of volunteers uh, to come and help us type in this data. Now, it's, it's always surprising to me that people will happily volunteer to do this but there are thousands of people out there who will gladly spend their spare time helping science out um, by doing useful tasks, which anyone could do. You know, it, it doesn't take an expert to read those pages. Um, um, so you know, this is a task that anyone could do. Uh, and so we, we managed to recruit several thousand volunteers um, given a sort of a very simple web interface. They were typed in one column at a time uh, to complete a task and then they were shown another column and another column and another column. They could do as much or as little as they wanted. Um, we had several hundred volunteers do a large fraction of the work. Um, but something that, you know, probably about 10 person years of effort was put in by the volunteers. Um, but because we had so many, we completed the rescue in just three months. Uh, these one and a half million observations taken by those intrepid um, weather observers all that time ago are now uh, in digital form for us to use. So the fastest way of getting new observations is actually by looking back in time. Um, and I think that's an important message. There's lots more data that we could rescue. So once they'd done this, they took about three months. Um, we asked them, well, you know, are you bored yet? You know, uh, and I was again very surprised to hear the answer. No, we're not bored. We're enjoying this. Um, uh, please find us more data to, to, to rescue. Um, so that was a surprise. Um, so we went, right, what do we do next? Um, there aren't any other of these amazing stories of, of um, uh, crazy uh, weathermen living at the top of a mountain. Um, so we decided to go a bit broader. But first of all, I should talk about the data. Um, so this is some of the data taken by, um, uh, that we've now rescued. Um, here is the hourly temperature data from the top of a mountain. Um, at this time, you can see the annual cycle. The average temperature they experienced was zero degrees. Um, they lived you know, essentially at freezing point on average all year round. Um, so there's the data, anyone can access it. It's publicly available now for anyone to download. We have data for hourly rainfall. Um, again, anyone can download and use this data. So we had some very heavy rainfall events that you could go and look at, for example. Uh, and here is the atmospheric pressure of data, which we can now use to go back into our reanalysis and learn about those storms um, that went across the country. So we have these two locations, the top of the mountain and the foot of the mountain in Fort William hourly pressure observations now digitally available. So when we asked the volunteers, you know, how, how do we continue? Well, so we um, turned to another source of data, um, which um, is essentially the data that the Met Office used to draw that synoptic chart we saw um, a few slides ago. That, that's that chart which the Met Office had drawn at 8 o'clock in the morning for this particular storm. And this is the page of data which they used to draw that chart. It's a, what's called their daily weather report. Um, and on the left-hand side, you can see a list of locations, 50 or 60 stations from all over Europe, uh, Scandinavia, the British Isles, uh, Germany, France, Spain, and Portugal, um, uh, all sent their data by telegraph cable to London and also to Paris and other places where they were collated and handwritten in these tables um, and, and published 
Uh, and all of these documents have now been scanned uh, and all available for anyone to look at and use, but very, very little of this data is available digitally for us to analyze. So this is what we asked the volunteers to do next, um, to read the handwriting. So this is a, very, it's a, much, a bit of a harder challenge, but again, it's something that anyone can do. We don't need to be an expert to read um, these values written on these pages. Um, and then over the next six months, the volunteers managed to rescue another 1.8 million observations um, taken all across Europe for the 1900 to 1910 period. Um, and by the time they got to the end of that, they were starting to get a bit bored. Um, and so we, we did pause the project at that point. Um, but so that 3.3 million observations are now available for us to use and analyze. So you might wonder, are these volunteers any good at rescuing these observations? What is their accuracy? You, know, you might worry that people are typing in the wrong number or misreading the handwriting. Um, but so for a very small number of those stations, we already had the data digitized by another source. So this is one example for the, for the town of Stornoway in Scotland. Uh, one person uh, about a decade ago had gone and uh, typed in all the data for Stornoway, just one location. Um, and we have that data digitally to compare with what the volunteers typed in. And so the blue line uh, is the data that was typed in about a decade ago, uh, and the orange line is the data now rescued by our volunteers. Um, we have five volunteers type in every single number, so we can pick up occasional errors that they will ine inevitably make. But the agreement is very, very, very good. You know, in the vast majority of the cases for this six-year period, um, the observations are identical, apart from a very tiny offset due to how the, the database is created at the moment. Um, but there's a number of um, cases where there's actually disagreements. Um, and we've gone in and checked every single one of those disagreements. Uh, and in all but one case, the error is in the original transcription done by a single person a decade ago. Um, we can go back and check the original documents. Um, and you know, because one person was doing it, you know, there are inevitable mistakes. Um, and so we can identify those by having this duplicate reconstruction now and the volunteers got the right answer because we have five of them which means we could pick up their mistakes. On the one case where um, the original data was, was the correct data, uh, the volunteers had actually got it right, they typed in the correct number but the original documents, the handwriting, had been written down incorrectly. During the transmission from Stornoway to London there a mistake had been made by someone else uh, and the, the wrong number was handwritten on the sheets but the volunteers typed it incorrectly. So we can be very, very confident about the accuracy and robustness of the data that the volunteers are rescuing for us. So we now come back to our map of observations that are, we have available to reconstruct the past this, this storm, for example, in 1903. And this is looking far healthier. Uh, we now have much more observations uh, from the UK, from France, from Scandinavia. Um, a few of these observations have actually been done in other projects, um, but most of them have come from our weather rescue project. And so now we can think about well, what difference does it make having these observations to that reconstruction of that extreme storm? Can we, can we do better than we could before um, at reconstructing uh, that event? Now we're able to um, send just a, a, a fraction of those observations, of some of them, um, to the team in America who create the 20th century reanalysis, so Gil Compo and his team. We, we gave them some of our extra observations and they were kind enough to rerun the reanalysis system for a short period um, around this storm so that we could test the value of those observations. So on the left-hand side, we see the original simulation of the reanalysis, um, and on, in the middle, we have the reanalysis with our new observations. And the storm is now about five millibar deeper than it was before, um, and looking more like the, um, the, the synoptic chart drawn by the Met Office that morning. So the extra observations have deepened the storm made it more realistic, uh, and it's also simulated with much higher confidence because we have more observations constraining this ensemble of, of a reanalysis uh, system to, to, to re recreate this storm. So it's, it's deeper and, we're, and it's simulated with much higher confidence. So that's, that's, a, that's a very good start. Um, and obviously when we add all of the new observations, um, th this will also improve further um, uh, as, as we go forward and add more and more observations. But what does it mean, say, for the winds? So we, we saw earlier that perhaps the winds were not going to be strong enough in the original reanalysis. So if we look at, say, the probability in the, this ensemble of reanalyses, um, uh, what fraction of those members, the ensemble members in that reanalysis, 
showed damaging wind speeds um, uh, over the UK during this, this storm. Um, and so we see some areas where there's very high confidence of having damaging wind speeds um, on the left-hand side. When we're adding in the new observations, we see much higher wind speeds, higher probability of getting damaging winds in the simulation um, uh, to, to essentially, so the wind speeds increased, more likelihood of damage uh, being simulated. So the question is, you know, what can we do with this? Can we evaluate this um, uh, simulation of the damaging wind speeds? You know, we have those postcards of all the damage that was caused by the storm, um, but because it was such extreme storm, a special report was commissioned by the Royal Meteorological Society um, to map out all of the damage that was created by this storm. And so this is a map that was drawn in 1903, just after the storm, and all the little symbols on this map show where damage was recorded, either to buildings uh, or to ships or to trees uh, or so on. And so we have a, a very detailed map of the damage caused by this storm. Um, and the place where we know the damage happened is where we're simulating the stronger winds. So again, this gives us an independent verification, validation um, of the simulation. The extreme winds cause this damage uh, and we can see, we can compare our simulations with the, the, this very detailed estimate of, of the locations where that damage occurred. So again, this is giving us more confidence that these observations that we're rescuing are adding value, simulating these extreme events uh, in much more coherent uh, and, and um, confident way. Um, we can also do the same with rainfall. So it, again, it's right at the start, I showed those postcards of extreme flooding over parts of the UK. One of those was in June. Uh, 1903 um, and again when we add in the new observations so you go from the left hand panel to the middle panel to some of our new pressure observations have allowed uh, uh, have produced a simulation with much higher amplitude rainfall um, and we can compare that with the gridded observations um, of, of rainfall and again we're getting this, the simulation of this the rainfall of this storm in the right place um, and with higher intensity than we had before it's still not intense enough. So again, as we go progress forward, we'll add in more observations. We'll have more confidence in the circulation. We expect, again, the simulated rainfall to increase. But we're also rescuing rainfall observations from these documents as well. And so that will also improve our gridded observation products, direct observations as well. And so not only are we adding these pressure observations to um, better create the dynamic circulation um, of, of the weather systems, we're also being able to uh, add that data to our gridded observation data sets to better represent the gridded um, rainfall, for example, for this very extreme flooding event. So in numerous different ways, we're better able to, to examine extreme weather events by rescuing these observations by our volunteers. But we could go further. If we now look at our map again, so remember we had the yellow dots being what we had available at the start, the black dots are the dots we've already added the red dots are places where we have the images of the observations, but no one has yet gone away and typed them in. Um, and so, you know, there's again an, an order of magnitude more observations for the UK to add um, to our uh, databases, which would transform again our ability to simulate these extreme weather events. But this takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of volunteers and money to go away and rescue this data. But it's all there in the archives. We have the photographs. It just needs someone uh, well, lots of people to help type it in or maybe even develop these automatic techniques to read the data automatically. But that's going to be quite a challenge, I think. But again, every country around Europe and around the world will have more data in their archives to rescue uh, and better simulate the, the weather and the climate of the past. The volunteers are still going. Um, they got excited again. Um, uh, so they're currently, um, so if you log on to weatherrescue.org today, um, you're currently able to type in weather observations from 1874. Uh, again, it's from the Met Office Daily Weather Reports. Um, here's one example of the page um, from eight, July the 31st, 1861. Um, again, so this data has now been rescued by our volunteers, another half a million observations to add to our databases. Um, and for those weather geeks in the audience, why is July the 31st, 1861 an important day? is the day of the first ever public weather forecast by Fitzroy. So this is, this is Met Office making the very first public weather forecast um, in the Times newspaper, and this we now have the data from that weather forecast um, to use in our reconstructions. So to conclude, 
The fastest way of getting new observations is by looking back in time. We have enormous archives in every country around the world of undigitized meteorological data, billions of observations back to the 1700s. I estimate one billion in the UK alone. So the digitization of this data would substantially improve our reconstructions, uh, our reanalyses, including for these very extreme events that we've shown here. Um, so our volunteers, thousands of volunteers, have helped rescue 3.8 million observations already, um, but we need to speed up, we need to go faster, and we need to keep scanning because a lot of these observations are at risk of being permanently lost. Some are in archives um, which are not stored brilliantly, and they are at risk uh, of, of being lost completely. And one small plug, if you want to help lead weatherrescue.org, we're about to advertise for someone to, to lead this project for the next three years. So if you're interested, please come and talk to me. Thank you very much.